Annie Bain never saw her husband's body after he was killed. But she did, for a brief moment, see something that he had been wearing when it happened. They promised to bring it back. They promised that they, they couldn't leave it with me. I told them to give me. But they said, no, they will get back to me with it. This came up during our interview with Annie last year. We had been talking with her at her home for about an hour when she told us the story about something that happened to her in the weeks after the executions and the U.S. invasion. One day, she couldn't remember the exact date, a group of officers had shown up at her door. They were investigating the murder of Prime Minister Maurice Bishop, her husband, Norris Bain, and the others executed with them. These officers were not Grenadian. They were part of a group of Caribbean peacekeeping forces. There's a few of them because it was in the veranda they're talking to Right me. here? Yeah, right here. In the same house. Mm-hmm. Maybe about four or five of them. A few of them came. In Annie's recollection, the officers had shown up to ask for her help, to have her identify a piece of evidence. They had the gut Norris been a ring. I saw the ring. She knew the ring. It was distinctive. She said her husband was part of a mechanics lodge and that the ring had the lodge's symbols on it, an alpha and an omega. So I saw that. I saw the ring and I even I asked them, I said, where they got the ring? So they brought jewelry with them yes, to show you? to show me and to know if I recognized any of it. And I recognized Norris ring. Yes, and I told them, I said, you must have gotten the ring on a finger. Annie was certain that her husband had been wearing this ring when he was killed. So to her, this always read as a clue. She believed that the men showing her this ring must have recovered it from her husband's body. And she saw something else that she recognized, something that belonged to Maurice Bishop. I even see Maurice bracelet. They had quite a few exhibits. Why did they say they couldn't give it to you right then? Why did they need to hold well, on Well, they to didn't it? explain, but I, I mean, to, to my own knowledge, I realized that they couldn't give it to me just like that. I figured that, well, whatever job they was doing, they're responsible. So you can go back and tell whoever you, that you give me to be in the ring. You know, couldn't do that. Because they had to keep these things for for the investigation and things like that. Yeah. Did they tell you that, or that's just your understanding now? No, they didn't tell me, but they, they said that they would get back to me with the uh, thing. And then you never got that jewelry back either? No. Never. From the Washington Post, I'm Martine Powers, and this is The Empty Grave of Comrade Bishop. Episode 3. Annie has been turning over this moment in her life again and again for 40 years. And my impression of the way that she told us about this memory was that she thinks that there's nothing else to pull out here. But there are details in her memories that led us somewhere new. In addition to this story about the jewelry, she told me that she'd heard about something that happened the night of October 19th, just after the Grenadian army had killed Norris Bain, Maurice Bishop, and the rest of the group. Annie said that she'd heard that the bodies were first taken to an army camp at Calavini. Calavini is a peninsula on the southern coast of the island, just a few miles from the capital. There is people that were in Calavini that know what went on. Whoever was responsible for digging the, the trench to put them, whoever was responsible for bringing tires or whatever they put to burn them, they knows. We wanted to understand better 
what happened between the hours right after the killings and that moment when Annie was faced with the ring. To do that, we had to hear from people who were there. A lot of the witnesses to these moments are no longer alive, but a few of them are. We tracked down two people who could speak to the hours after the execution. They helped dispose of the bodies. One was Callistus Bernard. He was the officer who ordered the soldiers to fire on Bishop. As a reminder, he served time in prison for the murders, and he wouldn't speak with us. The other person was not part of the group of 17 convicted in connection to the murders. We heard that he had a business on the island, right in the middle of Grenada's capital, St. George's. On a skinny little side street in the downtown area, there is a faded sign for a repair shop. It's called MP's Electrical Services, where, quote, only the best is good enough. Manly Philip is the owner of this shop. Um, I came from Washington, D.C., and we are interviewing people because we're working on a documentary about 1983. Manly is in his late 60s. He seemed surprised to get this ask, but he agreed to talk with us if we could come back in a few days. When we did come back, he showed us into his small office. Just um, take all that music for me, please. The music, just let me lower it down. Where we immediately noticed what was hanging on his walls. Can you describe what that is? This one, yeah? Oh, the, 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 the flag there and then oh, the... Okay, that's the flag of the revolution. After the revolution was realized, this is the, the flag that established the United Revolution. This one was the, um, the party, the New Drill Movement. Yeah. And you still have it up? I still have it up. 40 years later? Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Wow. Yep. And behind, and behind you, if you just pull the blind a little, then you will see um, Maurice Bishop International oh, Airport. wow. Here he's pointing to a bumper sticker with a photo of Maurice Bishop. So that yeah. was when they, when they named it after yeah, him? Yeah, uh-huh. Wow. Oh, my gosh. So you, you really like to represent that history yeah, here. Well, <laughs> that yes. is part of our history. Yeah, yeah. You know? Yeah. And I uphold it. Before he ran this repair shop, Manly Phillips served in the Grenadian Army, or the People's Revolutionary Army. That's what he was doing in 1983. He was an officer then, and one of his jobs was to train soldiers. I was uh, very active in the revolution, in the um, training school. Manley said he didn't witness the executions of Maurice Bishop and the others. But he was at Fort Rupert that afternoon, after the crowds of protesters had been shot at and had fled for safety. He was inside what had been the communications room of the fort. So he remembers hearing the sound of automatic gunfire. I heard this automatic fire. So evidently I I, I get panicked, so I run out. And I looked up in the direction where the fire came from. A superior officer was walking toward him, coming down from the upper level of the fort where the sound of the shots had come from. Manly confronted him. That is the first time I ever attempted to, well, disrespect a superior officer. So I said, what if, what happened up there? All he did? <laughs> As Manley made that sound, he drew his fingers across his throat. He would have seen when them guys were lined up. I talk about, when I say them guys, I talk about Maurice, his cabinet colleagues, until I was lined up. Then Manley went up to the top of the fort, to the outdoor square where the bodies were on the ground. The word he used to describe the scene was horrific. He said the bodies of his former comrades were mutilated, torn apart by bullets. Can I ask, when you, did you, um, do you recall how many bodies you saw when you, when you looked? No, at the time I did not check. At the time I did not check. But I have been able to identify a few other guys. Well, as for Maurice, you know the way I 
If you need a second too, we can. When I saw what was done to him, Maurice, it was heartbreaking. And uh, the other comrades like Norris Bean, Jacqueline Kreff, you know, that was, it was something else. Manley didn't know what to do after that. He just remembers being in a daze. He went to his barracks, lay down on his bed without taking off his boots, and put a pillow over his face. I don't know what time I fell asleep. But what I can see is that sometime during the night, I have no knowledge about the time. My door was knocked. When he opened the door, he saw a soldier standing in the darkness, a guy named Fabian Gabriel, who died a number of years ago. First thing, question he asked me, say, what, you know, to one body? Do you know how to burn a body? Well, I reacted in a, in a, I said, what, what, what kind of question are you asking me? Where did I come from? And then he laughed. And then he said, the chief asked me to accompany them to go down and um, get rid of the bodies. Manley learned then that he and Fabian had orders. They were supposed to oversee a group of soldiers who were going to drive the bodies out to the army camp at Calavini and then burn them. I asked him, why? Why not just return the bodies to their families? Manley didn't know, but he thought it might be because it would have been too awful for the families to see. That is to tell you how terrible this body was mutilated. Could you imagine you're going and bring this thing to your family members in that kind of condition? I could not see them guys doing it, no matter how bold face they feel they are, or they were, to, to do that. By the time Manley got outside, he says the remains of the people killed at the fort had already been loaded into the open bed of a large truck. According to Manley's memory, he and two other officers jumped into a Suzuki van to follow the truck to Calabini. They stopped at a fire station to pick up gasoline and tires, and they made their way toward the camp. Remember, there was a shoot-on-site curfew, so the roads were empty. They got to Calabini, but to get to the camp at the top of the hill, they had to get up a steep dirt road. He says it was pouring, so the road had turned into mud. The amount of rain, the amount of rain that fell that night, the truck, it took him in almost three quarters of an hour before he was able to reach up that hill. Because every time it skids down to the drain, so it was a struggle to get it on the road, to go up the hill, and then to um, unload. They found a trench on the outskirts of the camp. No, the place where the bodies were placed, it was not some that was dug any time in preparation for that activity. It was just there with all kind of old thing in it. The bodies were taken down from the truck, placed into the, the same pit. D- did you help with that? Did you carry some of the bodies? Well, what I have to tell you is the truth. No, I did not. I was there. I did not. Manley says his only order was to supervise the process. So you were watching them take yes, the Yes, I watched. I looked on. In what, in what state were the bodies? Did you see the bodies? And, and how were the bodies taken out of the, out of the truck? Again, I like to always refer to my, refle- my recollection. I can't remember seeing the bodies in any sheet or whatever it is. I believe up to that point, whatever clothes the person would have had on them, that is what, how they would have placed in them the hold. After that, he says that the soldiers put tires on top of the remains. They doused the tires in gasoline, and then they lit it all up. And he says they left Calabini. We left it burning. We left it burning. And I presume it would not have burned for long. Because you can't just put him over a tire just like that and expect it to burn for the whole night. That would not have happened. And uh, I don't think that took more than an hour and a half, generally, before we left. And then we returned to the, to the unit, the headquarters. Manley 
Manley says it was too dark to see exactly how many people were unloaded from the truck and who was who. But his description of the bodies of the executed people being moved to Calavini, that squares with testimony from witnesses in the murder trial that happened a few years later. Other soldiers, an army cook, they also said that they saw the bodies put onto a truck and placed in the trench at Calavini. And at least two of the defendants said that all eight people who were executed were taken there. Manley says he never came back to the pit, which left me with a question after we wrapped up. What he said about presuming the fire could not have burned for too long. I wondered how much damage the fire could have actually done to the remains if that was the case. We tracked down another soldier who was there a day or two after the bodies were left in the pit. So what do y'all want to do? What do y'all... Well, so we're trying to figure out... This guy, Roosevelt Daniel, said that he went up to Calavini during daylight. He had been given a bag and ordered to dispose of it there, in the pit. We don't know what was in the bag, and Roosevelt said that he never looked inside. So after I arrive, we take things, we pick up things from the foot. And we go down to Calavini and throw them down them way. They actually burn them people, you know? Burn the bodies and things like that. I know it might be hard to fully understand this, but he's saying that he picked the things up from the fort where the executions took place, and then he brought a bag to the pit where the bodies had been left. How big was the fire when you got there? Well, you didn't have really to say fire. You see the little smoke and things, you know, Mm -hmm. coming up and things like that, but to see see the actual fire, I didn't see the actual fire. Oh, so it wasn't like a big fire. It was no, just it, wasn't, it wasn't a big fire. Oh, wow. No, it wasn't a big fire. And he told us that the remains were still visible. The fire lit on the 19th was not enough to turn the remains into ash. We've talked to a couple forensic experts about this. We described to them this scenario. What would happen to a group of bodies if they were placed in a pit covered in tires, doused in gasoline, and set on fire. They said that they didn't think those circumstances would result in the cremation of a body. It takes hours and hours of sustained, super intense flames to cremate a body, basically a furnace. Putting bodies in a pit, starting a fire in the rain, and then leaving it, that wouldn't do it. So that's all to say, Based on our reporting, I feel pretty solid about this fact. At the end of the night of October 19th, and for at least a day after, those bodies were still in that trench. And that brings us to the other clue from Annie's story. Those police officers from the Caribbean peacekeeping troops who showed up at her door. Remember, she said that these officers brought her jewelry to identify, a bracelet that belonged to Maurice Bishop, along with her husband's ring. To show me and to know if I recognized any of it. And I recognized Norris' ring. And I told him, I said, you must have gotten the ring on a finger. She couldn't understand. Where did they get this jewelry from? If they had the ring her husband was wearing when he died, didn't that mean that they had his body? There's a lot that Annie Bain did not remember about that encounter. Like I said, she couldn't remember exactly what day it was. She also couldn't remember exactly how many officers were there. But she did remember a name. After the break, the search to find Annie's police officer. Annie Bain had told us that the officers who showed up at her door with her husband's ring were not from Grenada. They were actually from Barbados. And to explain why there were officers from Barbados in Grenada, we need to go back to October 25th, 1983, six days after the executions of Maurice Bishop and those who died with him. It's a Tuesday. In Washington, at the White House, reporters are gathered in the press briefing room, and they're waiting for the president. These reporters are here because they've heard that America might have just launched a secret invasion of a country with a population of less than 100,000 people. 
And the reporters want to know why. Here is the Prime Minister and also the President of the United States. When President Ronald Reagan walks into the room, he's not alone. The first person who enters is Eugenia Charles, the Prime Minister of the Caribbean island of Dominica. May I make a statement and then I shall present you. Early this morning, forces from six Caribbean democracies and the United States began a landing or landings on the island of Grenada in the Eastern Caribbean. Reporters knew that a ship, the USS Guam, had been diverted to the Caribbean, and they'd heard that American troops had started parachuting onto the island. What reports have you received of the success of the operation? At the initial operation of landing, securing the immediate targets, taking control of the airports, completely successful. Now, the Reporters also wanted to understand why the U.S. had gone in. Why it was in America's national interest to launch an attack on an island at the other side of the Caribbean Sea. And Reagan had an answer for that, too. American lives are at stake. We've been following the situation as closely as possible. Between 800 and 1,000 Americans, including many me- medical students and senior citizens, make up the largest single group of foreign residents in Grenada. By the way, this was all happening just a few years after the Iran hostage crisis, when embassy workers were kept as prisoners for over a year. So Reagan had been worried that these students in Grenada could be taken as hostages, too. He also made it clear that the U.S. didn't just up and decide to invade on their own. We acceded to the request to become part of a multinational effort with contingents from Antigua, Barbados, Dominica, Jamaica, San Lucia, St. Vincent, and the United States. I do have to point out here, it's actually Antigua and St. Lucia. And then all of them joined unanimously in asking us to participate. And that's when Prime Minister Eugenia Charles started to speak. I think we were all very horrified at the events which took place recently in Grenada. We, as part of the Organization of East Caribbean States, realizing that we are, of course, one region. We belong to each other, our kith and kin. We all have members of our state living in Grenada. At one point in this news conference, a reporter asked the president, President, Do you think that the United States has the right to invade another country to change its government? But I don't think it's an invasion, if I may answer that question. You can hear how Prime Minister Charles jumps right in there. This is a question about asking for support. We are one region. Grenada is part and parcel of us, an organization, and we don't have we don't have the capacity ourselves to see to it that Grenadians get the freedom that they require to have to choose their own government. So this is why there were Caribbean peacekeeping forces in Grenada just after the U.S. invasion. The mission was called Operation Urgent Fury. It started with that first wave of U.S. troops. They took control of the airport and evacuated the students and faculty at the medical school. They helped put in place a new interim government. They also killed at least 69 Grenadian and Cuban soldiers. As we heard, Reagan initially called the invasion completely successful. But that wasn't the full picture. We'll go deeper into this in a couple episodes, but what you need to know now is that the whole operation was later criticized for disorganization and poor planning. 19 American troops were killed during the invasion. Some of them were victims of friendly fire or accidents, including helicopter crashes. The U.S. also accidentally bombed a Grenadian mental hospital, killing many patients. In total, more than 20 civilians were killed in the course of the invasion. Along with the U.S. troops, there were those Caribbean peacekeeping troops, several hundred of them. The largest numbers came from Jamaica and Barbados. They were put in charge of guarding the prison, escorting prisoners of war, securing important government buildings, and questioning Grenadians about the events of October 19th. My guess was, this is where Annie's police officer came in. If we could somehow find him... That could help answer the question of what happened to the bodies after they were left in the Calavini army camp. I said earlier that Annie had a name. The problem was she only had part of a name. I only know him as Brophit. Prophet. Yeah, he, he introduced himself to me as Brophit. How do he you spell from, that? He's from, from Barbados. B-R-A-T-H-W-A-I-T. 
think so. Okay. And he was with the the Bayesian. Bayesian, if you don't know, is how you say from Barbados. Yes, he was the, the head of the peacekeeping from Barbados. In the British West Indies, the surname Brathwaite, which is often pronounced Bravit, is a very common name. Luckily, we found a first name pretty quickly in documents related to the criminal trial of the people convicted for murdering Maurice Bishop. There was a mention of testimony given by a police officer from Barbados, a Sergeant Colin Braffitt. Police control, good afternoon. Hi, good afternoon. Um, my name is Martine Powers. I'm calling from the Washington Post. I am trying to track down someone who used to be a police officer in Barbados. His name is Colin Brathwaite. Is there anyone? Rich Braffitt? Yeah, yeah, like B R A. Rich Braffitt, Rich Braffitt. See, lots of Braffitts. Colin. Colin. And then after being transferred. Well, he used to work here before, but he has retired, so. Hmm. How long ago did he retire? Um, he left here, but when I hold on. More than 10 years. Okay. Um, do you, do you know where I could reach him at home or? No, not exactly, no. So I turned to Facebook. I tried all the Bayesian Colin Braffitts there. I tried LinkedIn. I went down a rabbit hole trying to find a Colin Braffitt in Guyana. I needed help. I needed someone with connections, someone who could track down anyone. What I needed was an auntie. Hello. Hi, uh, Auntie Ray. Philip? No, this is Martine. This is uh, Francine's daughter, Martine. Oh, how are you, my dear? Good. How are you? Not too bad. What's up? This is my auntie Ray, Ray Skinner. She's Trinidadian, but she's been living in Barbados for more than 20 years. And she's technically not my aunt. She went to high school with my mom, but you know how it is. Your mom's friend is your auntie. Okay, so who is it you want to meet up with? So so it's a uh, uh, an older gentleman named Colin Brathwaite. That is such a common name. Yeah. Martin, such a common name, but what does he, like, in what area? I could definitely find out for you. I explained to her the whole deal, that he was this cop who went to Grenada sometime 40 years ago. No, I could definitely, I know enough people who will know him. Okay, so you can help? So, yeah, so give me the weekend. Well, how did you find the got from the... Airport. Oh, it was easy. Okay. It ended up taking longer than a weekend, but Auntie Ray did deliver. And a few months later, I was in Barbados, driving a rented Chevy Equinox up Highway 2A. And Auntie Ray was riding shotgun. So when you're in this lane, you either have to go straight... Or to the left. Right, okay. or to the left. What Auntie Ray had managed to figure out was that former Sergeant Colin Braffitt was active at an Anglican church in a small town on the other side of Barbados from where she lives. She had tried calling that church. I had tried calling. We never heard back. So we were driving out there. That's it. Yes. Yeah, St. Philip the Less. It was Sunday morning. We dressed up in church clothes, drove for about 45 minutes, and there it was. The stone building not far from the coast. There were people outside the church setting up for a lunch. Hi. Okay. Sorry to bother you. I'm actually looking for Mr. Colin Braffitt. Do you know Colin he's... Braffitt? Yeah. Well, he's inside. He's, uh, he's an uh, yes, altar service. Okay. Already. Colin is 75 years old. When I went up to him, he was chatting with members of the congregation. I explained to him who I was, what I was doing, and he was like, what? Uh, Okay, go get some food, and I'll come find you later. Finally, he came to sit down by Auntie Ray and me. And he said he didn't want to be interviewed. He said he didn't like thinking about that time, and he didn't think that anything he had to say would be useful. I told him, look, I'm going to be in Barbados, staying with my aunt for another couple days. Just think about it a little bit more. 
And then we left. So you don't think he's gonna call? I don't think so. I don't think so. Okay. I looked, I looked, I kept looking at him and I looking into his eyes and his eyes were back then. Mm -hmm. He looked at you like this, you know, it's kind of suspiciously, mm -hmm. but he remembers everything. Mm -hmm. He remembers everything. I felt that too. And so when I didn't hear back from him, I just called him again and he said, okay, come by tomorrow and we'll talk. Hi, Mr. Braffitt. I am. I'm parked up by the church. Okay. All right. Well, you can come down. Come down. Keep coming down the hill. Okay. Um, right. if, should, should I come in the car or just you, walk? No, man. You come in the car. Okay. Okay. You want to walk? Are you a, are you an athlete? <laughs> <laughs> so it turns out that Colin actually pronounces his last name Brathwaite, not Braffitt. And he retired from the police in 2014. He was a detective, a forensic specialist, the CSI guy. It's work that he found challenging, but also made him proud. He liked to be the guy who could give people answers. I loved it. To be able to interpret a, a crime scene uh, and say, well, look, this is what happened, that is what happened. Back in 1983, when he was sent to Grenada, Colin was in his mid-30s. He arrived just a few days after the start of the U.S. invasion, so about a week and a half after the executions. I asked him what he thought about the Americans' decision to go into Grenada. Politically and uh, militarily, um, I, I can't I can't say to you that that was that was my concern. When we got there, we were supposed to investigate the the, the matter at hand. That was the the death of Morris Bishop and the, all the other people. That, that was our understanding. And it was my job to find out how it happened and who did it. Though the invasion was a joint mission with the Americans, Colin said that he was only working with officers from other Caribbean countries. So once you got there and you learned that, that your job was going to be to investigate these murders of Maurice Bishop and the other people who, who died with him. How, how did you start that process? What, like, what, what do you do to begin the investigation? Well, how would I describe it? This, it, it would be the, the normal investigative techniques that you go um, trying to get witnesses and um, things like that, um, trying to find out what happened. The normal thing that you would do if you're going to get, investigate any matter, um, any, any murder, uh, you know, you try and get your witnesses, your information, and, and so on, and work and work from there. Colin said that some of these interviews were tough. Tracking down witnesses in a country he didn't know well, talking to distraught family members, and interviewing the people who would later be convicted of murder. Yeah, I remember all of them. There's some people that you um, wouldn't, really, wouldn't really forget. Um, Bernard Cord and so on. There were, there were quite a number of them. Colin's job wasn't just about interviewing witnesses and suspects. He was looking for evidence, too, especially the bodies. I asked him to explain why finding the bodies was so important. I mean, people knew that Bishop had been killed. It's not like there was a question about whether Bishop was dead or not, right? Yeah, but that's what people knew. Um, now, you've got to prove it from your investigations. Um, so to have the, the body, then we can have post-mortem done and so on and so forth, you know. Um, so in, like in any other murder case, you want to get your body. And that's why it was a big breakthrough when Colin tracked down a witness who gave him a tip. We received some, I would think, credible information of uh, where the bodies were buried. My information was that the bodies were at Calavini. When Colin heard this, he was excited, but also cautious. I was waiting, or sure my best to see if I can get a pathologist, a forensic pathologist, to accompany me to the, um, if I was going to do the excavation. And so I'd reach out to our pathologist here. In Barbados. In Barbados. 
Why did you want to wait for the pathologist to be there? Why not just take the bodies out and bring the pathologist later? No. No. If you're doing investigations, you got to do it right. Correct. So Colin and a group of police didn't go out to that grave until a few days later. We think that this would have been several weeks after the executions. And when they got there, they found the trench. But immediately, Colin knew something was strange. Yeah, well, the, the, the air was all dug up and there was uh, caution tape around it, you know. Um, and that's the first thing when I got there that alerted me that someone was there. Someone had gotten to the grave before him. Did you get the impression that uh, it was freshly opened, that it had been open for a long time? No, it, it, you know, you, you would have seen that it would have been freshly open. You could have, you could have seen that. And did you see any evidence of human remains? No, I, I, I don't remember seeing any, any remnants of human remains, no. I can say who took them, who didn't take them, but no bodies were there when I excavated the grave. And that's all I can say. That must be very frustrating if a big part of your investigation is looking for these bodies. Mm -hmm. It was. I can tell you that it was. At that time, I was pretty angry, really. Colin had wanted to find these bodies because they were important to his investigation. But most of all, he knew that they would be important to the families of the victims. Instead, all he found was an empty grave, or at least an almost empty grave. What I found then were things like um, jewelry, rings and things like that, which we took into our possession. And the jewelry, was it, um, where where was the jewelry? That would have been in, um, in the... Uh, in the soil, and you know, it had to be dug up and so on, so that would have been in the soil. He collected those pieces of jewelry. He knew that they'd later be used as evidence that he'd submit to the court. And he took them to the families of the victims to be identified. He remembers bringing them to Maurice Bishop's mother, Alimenta Bishop, who died a decade ago. And he remembers bringing them to Annie Bain. I remember her very well. What do you remember about her as a person, what she is like? Well, she was a very, um, she was very strong to me. Um, having lost her husband um, under those circumstances, she was pretty strong. Colin still remembers a story that Annie told him about driving home through the darkness on the night of her husband's murder. And he still remembers the way to her house. I have a hobby. Uh, I'm driving through countries on YouTube. This is a thing on YouTube that I only learned about after Colin told me about this hobby. There are these hour-long videos of scenic drives around the world that people post online. And one of the virtual drives he takes is along this road that comes down from Granitang Forest near Annie's home. And so when I drive through uh, Granitang, I always look for where Miss Bain lives. When Annie opened her door 40 years ago and saw Colin and other officers with her husband's ring, she thought it had meant that they had seen her husband's body. And she couldn't understand why they couldn't explain what had happened to his remains. But now I knew that that's because Colin also didn't know what had happened to his remains. He was confused too. This man who loved his job because he could give people answers about a crime, give them closure, he didn't have an answer for her. The jewelry that Colin found at the grave, he did later present it as evidence in court. His understanding was that it was then returned to the possession of the Grenadian police. He doesn't know what happened to it after that. We've asked Grenada's attorney general, as well as other members of the government, about the whereabouts of this jewelry and whether it could be returned to people like Annie Bain. They said they'd look into it. We followed up a couple times, but we haven't received an update as of publishing this episode. Did you 
find any other evidence of bodies or were you able to to get further in locating those bodies? No. Why not? Well. And this is when Colin seemed to start speaking more carefully. It appears to me as though the information we received was leaked and uh, other persons took the opportunity to get there before us. Who, who, according to your understanding, who found the bodies before you got there? Well, I, I, I can't say because I wasn't there. Do you, and, and, and I know that you don't know for sure, but what was going through your mind at the time of who you thought it might be that had already dug up the area? I, I, I thought we, we, we had a very good idea of um, whom there would have been, but I, I, don't, I, I don't want to mention that now. So did you think it was Grenadians who did it? No, oh, I don't think so. So do you think it was Americans that did it? I think the, I don't know, but the information that, going around, that was going wrong at the time um, would most certainly indicate that, but as I said, I don't know. Then I pulled out my phone and showed him a photo I'd saved. Have you seen this photo before? Mm-mm. It was a black and white news photo taken by a photographer for the Associated Press on November 8th, 1983. Mm, no, I have never seen this before. So this, this you have some more? The photos I'm showing Colin are of the pit at Calavini. They were taken three weeks after the executions. They are of a group of men, mostly soldiers with the U.S. Army. Some of the soldiers are inside of the pit. Some are standing around it at its edge. In one of the photos, two soldiers are next to the pit, holding either end of a body bag. One of the soldiers is mid-step, and it looks like they're starting to carry the body bag away. So you, you weren't at that scene? No. I took Colin through everything that we know about what happened after those photos were taken. And I told him that the U.S. insists that it does not have information about the whereabouts of the remains. That's what they say? They have, they, the U.S. government, the State Department says to this day, they don't have the bodies of Maurice Bishop and the others, and they don't know where they are. Well, but you, you see this, you see this photograph. Right. Okay. I've, I've never seen, I've never seen these pictures before. This is the first time I'm seeing these. Yeah, this is the first time I'm seeing these. And there is more to this than just these photos. If you were in the U.S. watching the news in November of 1983, you might have seen this. Although the shootings at the fort occurred almost three weeks ago, most of the bodies are still missing, including those of Prime Minister Bishop and his cabinet members. That's the voice of Mark Potter, a correspondent for ABC News. This is a TV report that he filed from Grenada that aired on November 8, 1983. On the screen, you can see the same scene as the one in the photo that I showed Colin. Soldiers with the U.S. Army gathered at Calavini, They are standing around a pit. Some of them seem to be digging. Mark Potter is out in front of them. This afternoon, a U.S. Army graves registration team began unearthing human remains at a destroyed Grenadian Army fort. They were told of the site by a civilian cook who said the bodies of Bishop and three others were dumped into this trench and burned. The Army says it may take several days to make a positive identification. So here is what we know. On that Tuesday in November of 1983, the U.S. military did find bodies in a pit at Calavini. They exhumed them. And this wasn't done quietly. It happened, at least in part, in front of reporters and photographers who were at the scene. We also know that two days later, those bodies were examined by a forensic team from the U.S., This team was sent at the request of the U.S. State Department to try to figure out if these remains belonged to Maurice Bishop and the other people executed with him. 
There were not many Grenadians who were aware of all this when it was happening. As far as we know, reports by American news outlets were not filtering back to Grenadians at that time. But in subsequent years, more Grenadians have heard about what happened at Calavini. They have seen the photos that I showed to Colin. They have heard about the forensic exam. Some of them have even seen the results of that exam. But those results were complicated. And when they started to get around, that is when people began to ask, what exactly happened in this exam? That day, uh, they called and said, we're bringing some bodies over. The Army wants to look at some bodies. Uh, Can we use your gross lab? That is next time on The Empty Grave of Comrade Bishop. If you want to see the photos that I showed to Sergeant Colin Brathwaite, including the photo of U.S. soldiers carrying a body bag out of that pit, you will definitely want to check out our episode guide. That is where we've been compiling photos, videos, documents, and other archival material from our reporting. You can find it at WashingtonPost.com slash Empty Grave. There's also a link in our show notes. Episode four will be out next week on Wednesday, November 8th. But subscribers to The Washington Post can access it on Monday, two days early, on Apple Podcasts. If you're already a subscriber to The Post, you can connect your subscription automatically through The Washington Post channel on Apple Podcasts. And if you are not yet a Post subscriber, go to WashingtonPost.com slash subscribe or look for the link in our show notes. And if you've got thoughts on what you've heard so far in the series, we would love to hear from you. Hit us up at emptygrave at washpost.com. The Empty Grave of Comrade Bishop was reported and produced by me, Martine Powers, along with Ted Muldoon and Renny Svernovsky. Our editors are Sarah Childress and Renita Jablonski. Fact-checking by Nicole Pasolka. Mix editing by Theo Balcom. Our series theme and music is by Keshav Chandradath Singh. Mixing, sound design, and additional music by Ted Muldoon and Renny Svernovsky. Our show art was designed by Lucy Nayland. Project editing by Casey Shaper. Thank you to Allison Michaels. And a shout out to Auntie Ray. Finally, if you've been appreciating what you've heard so far, we would love if you could rate and review us on your podcast app. And also, share it with friends and family that you think would be into this story. Thank you so much for listening to The Empty Grave of Comrade Bishop. And we will see you next week for episode four.